It reads, verse 1, As for the one who was weak in faith, welcome him, but not to quarrel over opinions. One person believes he may eat anything, while the weak person eats only vegetables. Let not the one who eats despise the one who abstains, and not let the one who abstains pass judgment on the one who eats, for God has welcomed him. Who are you to pass judgment on the servant of another? It is before his own master that he stands or falls, and he will be upheld, for the Lord is able to make him stand. One person esteems one day as better than another, while another esteems all days alike. Each one should be fully convinced in his own mind. The one who observes the day observes it in honor of the Lord, and the one who eats, eats in honor of the Lord, since he gives thanks to God, while the one who abstains, abstains in honor of the Lord and gives thanks to God. The one, for none of us lives to himself, and none of us dies to himself. For if we live, we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. So then whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. For to this end, Christ died and lived again. That he might be Lord of both the dead and the living. Why do you pass judgment on your brother? Or you, why do you despise your brother? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. For it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess to God. So then each of us give an account of himself to God. Let us pray before we jump in. God, we thank you um, for your word. Lord, I pray that, um, Lord, that our opinions... That diversity on Christian liberty, Lord, I pray that we can see that it exists, yet I I pray that, uh, God, we as a a local body will learn to deal with that diversity in love and in care for one another. Lord, I pray, as, as you have inspired Paul to say, God, I pray that there is no despising, there is no judgment of one another. God, we just thank you for your word. Lord, I pray that um, that through your word that there will be, Lord, that you will make it clear where where we we may have made idols. And Lord, I pray that you break us of that. God, we thank you for who you are and what you do today. And Lord, I, I pray that as we focus on you that we can lay all distractions aside and that we can just focus on your word and who you are and what we are in you. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Um, So this morning there are four points. We have avoid conformity, avoid division, avoid pride, and avoid judgment. So the first point, again, is avoid conformity. I want to talk a little bit about some first century issues that Paul really brings out in this text. So what we see is that in the church of Rome, there was some beautiful diversity, but with beautiful diversity, this created tension. Right In this diversity, it created tension. And if, if you know, if you've been in a diverse situation, you know when true diversity exists, unity requires effort. Right? Unity requires effort where true diversity exists. Yesterday, for example, um, Saturday, it was Saturday, uh, I asked my kids, I told them, I said, I want to take you guys out to lunch. Where do you want to go? And no one really knew what they wanted to eat. My, my daughter then said, I want taco time. Now, in our house, taco time is Rio Grande. And my son says, no, 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 I want Graziano's. Now, Grazi, oh, he wants pizza time, and pizza time is, is Graziano's. So we got a taco time. we got a pizza time. I said I wanted Red Girl in my house. Everything has a code name. Red Girl in my house is Wendy's. And after hearing us go back and forth, I'm trying to talk them into Red Girl. Claire's trying to talk us into taco time. Maddox is, is pushing hard for pizza time. My wife... She just wanted another pot of coffee and some Advil after about 20 minutes of this. But when you look at verse 2, right, it says, One person believes he may eat anything, while the weak person eats only vegetables. Now, this seems crazy, that someone's going to get an argument over what people eat. Right? But, but understand, a lot of this stuff is cultural. 
There are things that we debate about in the American church that abroad, they're like, why? I don't understand. Something's not computing. Right? Go, go to church in Germany, to a Protestant church in Germany, right? and they're going to think that controversy is over drinking. They're going to go, I don't understand. I don't get it. So, so look, we got one person who believes he may eat anything while the weak person eats only vegetables. So what we see, right, Jews in Rome, some Jews in Rome wanted to obey the religious law. I'm actually really curious if this is a callback to Daniel eating only vegetables during the Babylonians' captivity. Uh, I, I'm curious if, that, if that's what the, the call was to. But anyways, what we see is that meat is permitted in Old Testament law. But for some reason, many in Rome had become vegetarians. And so we see this debate forming over dietary law. You heard um, Jeremy Ball read out of 1 Corinthians, chapter 8. And what are they debating? The same exact thing that they're debating in, debating in, in Rome. So what, what you have, in essence, is this divide between Roman Christians who come back from the grocery store with meat, inviting their Jewish Christians to a barbecue, and, right, and what you have is tension, you have gossip, you have offense, and strife begins to show up. But that's not the only thing that they are debating. If you look in verse 5, right, we see other parts of the law as well being debated. Verse 5 of 14 says, One person esteems one day as better than another. Why another day, or why another esteems all days alike? Each one should be fully convinced in his own mind. Right, this was likely a controversy that had to do with, with the Sabbath. Right, the commandment to rest on the seventh day, which is Saturday, is not repeated in the New Testament, but it is a good principle for us. It is wise to rest. It is wise to Sabbath well. But see, what we have is Jewish Christians in Rome who were probably seeking to observe that Saturday Sabbath while worshiping on Sunday mornings too, while Gentile Christians, right, they don't observe the Saturday Sabbath like the Jews. They're only worshiping on Sunday morning. And again, tensions, gossip, and strife begin to show up because of these differing opinions. Now, these type of controversies don't only, don't only exist in the first century church, right? They exist in modernity. One of my favorite examples of this is Charles Spurgeon and Joseph Parker. Two of these were two famous British preachers. They were, they were so good friends. They would sometimes swap pulpits. Uh, they would preach at each other's churches. They trusted each other to that degree. Now, Spurgeon got upset with Joseph Parker because he attended the theater, Right, he was watching plays, and this was offensive. Because he thought to himself, why, why would a good Christian go to something horrible like the theater? And Joseph Parker said, whoa, whoa, you're the cigar-smoking pastor. I don't want to hear it. How can you talk to me about going to the movie theater while you're smoking on your stogie? And so they... They got upset with each other because of over differing opinions on these issues. Who was right? Were they both right? Were they both wrong? Or both cinemas and cigars condemned in Scripture? The answer is they probably both made too big of a deal of it. And so today, right, we're not going to be arguing over meat or Sabbath days, but we do share our controversies and uh, too many controversies in the church. So until I moved to West Virginia, I didn't know there, and, and this is, I'm from Southern Virginia, so I didn't know about the KJV only like controversy. Plus, I wasn't a, I wasn't a believer for, for really until 1819 in that realm. I, wasn't, I did not believe in Jesus. So when I moved here as a babe in Christ and I was told KJV only, I'm thinking, why? I don't understand. So what I learned here is in Bible translations, that's a, that's a real controversy. Church culture, whether it's lighting, music, uh, musical styles, parking, dress. I told you all one time that we, someone told me that I didn't preach the gospel because we have LED lights. I don't get it. I didn't understand that. Still don't. I've heard controversy over tattoos, clothing, makeup, movies, dancing, card playing. 
whether or not you should drink wine or whether you can have alcohol or whether you, everyone should abstain. We've heard controversies over cigars, cigarettes. I think we all can agree that vaping's weird. <laughs> Don't understand that. But I love this quote. I love this quote by, by Leslie Flynn and in a book called Great Church Fights. I love it. It says, why disagreements exist today in our churches over certain practices? A Christian from the South may be repelled by a swimming party for both men and women than offend his northern brother by lighting up a cigarette. Controversies, opinions, and preferences exist in abundance. Now listen, and, and I'm, I'm guilty of this as much as anybody else. What, what we want to make sure we're not doing is making our preferences prerequisites to the gospel. We have to make sure we're not making our preferences prerequisites to the gospel because when we do that, really what we're doing is making an idol. I remember, I mean, I, I did the same thing. I said, I would, n- I, Julie, man, she was so patient with me. When we first got together, I was, I, I was like on a crusade never to wear khakis in a church. And I almost looked down on churches where they were khakis because who made khaki holy and and i like denim and i remember there's one thing being free to wear denim but there's something completely despising those who wear khaki right there's some unhealthiness there so as christians right we are to take these opinions and these preferences that are in abundance and, and, and what we need to do is avoid division avoid pride and avoid judgment. And that's my next point is avoid division. So 14 verse 1 says, As for the one who is weak in faith, welcome him, but not to quarrel over opinions. Before I want to go any for- further, can we all agree and give me a hearty amen that Scripture is the authority of faith and practice? Amen? All right. Some of, y'all, some of y'all are quiet on that one because you don't know where I'm going. So, Scripture is the authority of faith and practice. So, what we're going to do is we're going to put Scripture before what we... If, it doesn't matter if we agree with Paul. Right? It doesn't matter if we agree with the Holy Spirit. Like that, what we are going to live by is what Scripture says. As for the one who is weak in faith, welcome him, but not to quarrel over opinions. Um, when my wife and I first got married, we went to... Taiwan, and we were um, we met up with some missionaries, and um, their capital is called Taipei, a beautiful, beautiful city. And while we were there, of course, when we went, of course, anytime you travel, they say, "Don't ask what you're eating, don't ask." Well, we're eat, we're at this um, like a hot plate type place, and we have a bunch of raw, unidentified things, and you are to put them in in different sauces and stuff like that, and you're to cook it and you eat it. Well, man, this there was this one sauce; it was thick. It was kind of spicy. It was real red. And I was like, man, this is really good. What is this? And the woman who was, who was a native to Taiwan, she looked at me and she said, that is congealed pig's blood. I, I, was, I was taken back for a second. I didn't really know what to say. I didn't want to stop eating as I have like a lump of something in my mouth. I didn't want to ask what I was chewing. I, I, all I could say was, this is the best congealed pig's blood I think I've ever had. This is... A, <laughs> This is really good. But what I remember is that she told me that this is actually really controversial for Christians in Taiwan. Whether or not you should eat this congealed pig's blood. The blood of another animal in the Old Testament. There's dietary laws about that. And I'm like, but it's really good. They're like, they don't care about that. Like it's, they're, they're looking at Old Testament law and say, what should we do with this? So what we see is some Christians are more affected by things than others. They're more sensitive about things than others. And I want to make it clear, the weak in faith should not be seen as purely a negative thing. It really just means a thinner skin. So if you are more conservative, if you're a conservative Christian on on these 21st century issues, let me be very clear, you're not less of a Christian. But listen, if you're troubled by everything, if everything upsets you, if everything gets under your skin, what Paul describes you, how he describes you in this verse, it, he describes it as a weakness. Because it's a failure to see the freedom that is in Christ. Look, Christian liberty is a real thing. Let us not be mistaken on that. There is liberty in Christ Jesus. 1 Corinthians 6, 12, right? It says, all things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. 
All things are lawful for me, but I will not be dominated by anything. 1 Corinthians 10, 23 and 24. All things are lawful, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful, but not all things build up. Let no one seek his own good, but the good of his neighbor. So what we see, right, in, in these couple of verses, they're echoing something that Paul is going to be talking about, that there is, you have permissibility to do certain things. But these things ought to be helpful. They ought to cause, at least, if nothing else, gratitude to God in worship and thanks. But all of it should be done through the lens of, is, is, am, am I hurting my neighbor? Am I able to glorify God by doing this? So these issues exist not only in Rome, but they exist in Corinth. They exist in Taiwan, and they exist in West Virginia, in Huntington, in Milton, and Taze Valley as well. So Paul's first point, right, is that we are not to fight over these open-handed issues. If we can all agree that we should fight for the gospel and not for your opinion, not for my opinion, we should fight for the gospel. These open-handed issues are not worth dividing over or fighting over. Right? We should fight and take a stand on certain things, like the doctrine of sin and depravity, the authority of the Bible, Jesus' de- deity, his death, his resurrection, salvation by grace through faith, alone in Christ, alone on those things we die. But the call not to quarrel over opinions is a call not to divide. The next point is avoid pride. Verse 3 says, let not the one who eats despise the one who abstains. And, not, and let not the one who abstains pass judgment on the one who eats. For God has welcomed him. Right? The word despise means to be prideful of self or to look up or look down excuse me, upon others. And so the, the Bible makes it clear, right? There is liberty on these issues. Listen, I do not drink. For a multitude of reasons. For me, it would be unwise. For me, it would be hurtful to people that I love dearly. For me, who struggles with self-control, right, I should stay away from it. I'm also under uh, a contract under um, NAM, the North American Mission Board, that says I will not. So it would be dishonest for me to do. But let me explain. I will argue that alcohol in moderation is biblically permissible. I do not smoke. I, I, I don't smoke. It's not wise for me to smoke because, again, I would hurt people who I love dearly if I did. But let me argue, tobacco in moderation is biblically permissible. I, I like Christian music, but you do not have to listen to K-Love. You're biblically, it's, it's biblically permissible not to do that. What I've seen often from, from those who, who like and embrace Christian liberty, what I've seen is a lack of humility on behalf of my brothers and sisters who do not partake in Christian liberties. Right? If we are not careful, it can lend itself to pride. Sadly, and I'm not kidding, I have heard and I have seen Christians measure the spiritual depth of themselves and other people based on whether they take part in some of the controversial liberties. Listen to what verse 3 says. Let not the one who eats despise the one who abstains. If you do, it lends itself to elitism. It's unhealthy. You start measuring people not on the, on the basis of whether they love Jesus, but on whether or not they agree with your opinions. Rather than assume right, that, that they, that the people who disagree with you are some sort of neurotic fundamentalist, let me encourage you to assume that they are strict for God's glory. I would like that we would think the best of our brothers and sisters in Christ. 1 Corinthians 14, 25-29 says, so again, this is Paul actually te- teaching this to the church of Corinth who struggles with the same stuff. It says, eat whatever is sold in the meat market without raising any question on the ground of conscience. For the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. If, 
if one of the believers invites you to dinner and you are disposed to go, eat whatever is set before you without raising any question on the ground of conscience. But if someone says to you, this has been offered in sacrifice, then do not eat it for the sake of the one who informed you and for the sake of conscience. And I do not mean your conscience, but his. Just because you can do something doesn't mean you always should. Our liberties are situational. Right? They are very situational. Things that Scripture condemns, by the way, are not Christian liberties. Right? Smoking weed's not a Christian liberty. That's called illegal. You can go back to Rome, uh, read Romans 13. Right? Drunkenness is not a liberty. It's a sin. Scripture calls it out. Sleeping with your girlfriend isn't a Christian liberty. It's sexual sin. Things that Scripture condemns make it clear they are not Christian liberties. What he's saying here is that liberties are situational. So if, if in the presence of a weaker brother, don't do it. Love that person more than the liberty that you have. In fact, with your liberty, show that you love them. It's important to remember, for those who understand Christian liberty, what Christian liberty is. Right? It's not an attitude of perm uh, permissible rebellion. There's a great um, book, in fact, that, that, that was given to me just last week by a guy named J.D. Crowley, and he writes, um, it's not cool, uh, it, it, that our mindset shouldn't be that it's cool. Finally, I get to do all the stuff I've wanted to do, but uh, my stripped upbringing wouldn't let me. Right? He calls that, and he's right, he calls that immaturity. Because that's what that is. He said, oh, I got Christian liberty, I'm going to drink, I'm going to do all these things. That's called immaturity. Christian liberty is for the mature. It is to be flexible enough for the sake of the gospel. That's what you see in, in Romans 14. That's what you see in 1 Corinthians. Christian liberty is for the mature. It is to be flexible enough for the sake of the gospel. Romans 14, 6 through 9 reads, The one who observes the day observes it in honor of the Lord. The one who eats, eats in honor of the Lord. Since he gives thanks to God, while the one who abstains, abstains in honor of the Lord and gives thanks to God. For none of us lives to himself, and none of us dies to himself. For if we live, we live to the Lord. And if we die, we die to the Lord. So then whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. For to this end, Christ died and lived again, that he might be both Lord, both of the dead and of the living Hopefully you see that no matter where you are in all of this, what we do is for the glory of God. Right? The point is, to those who, who partake, it, it's, it's not to get others to partake with you. That should not be the goal. You can partake and you can enjoy these liberties, but you are to partake to the glory of God. And those who abstain, you can abstain from particular liberties, but what is the goal? To abstain to the glory of God. Again, I, for those who do partake, you ought not be more passionate to evangelize those, on, to evangelize to get those people to take part in those liberties, but respecting those who abstain. Since it is a liberty, right, it should be an honor to lay it down for the benefit of our brother, our sister, our wife, or our husband. Too many times, again, I've seen those who drink in moderation, whatever it may be, they look down on those who do not. This is not what Scripture calls our attitude to be. Right? One who abstains, you do it for the glory of God. We who abstain, we do it out of conviction. But again, those of us who abstain. This here, listen to what Paul exhorts to us. In verse 3, let not the one who eats despise the one who abstains. Now listen carefully. And let, let not the one who abstains pass judgment on the one who eats. For God has welcomed him. 
So what, those who take part, right, you've been called not to show disdain towards those who do not take part, those who abstain. And for those who abstain, right, we're called not to pass judgment on these open-handed issues. So we see, again, next point is avoid judgment. Conscience um, is what, what Paul is telling you to do is follow that conscience. It's that inner feeling, that, that inner moral, gu- that, excuse me, that moral compass that's acting as a guide to, for, to right or wrong behavior. Now, God's morality comes first. But when that doesn't necessarily speak clearly to every issue, conscience comes into play. The Christian has a born-again conscience. So if something makes you feel bad, you should not do it. But if that thing makes you feel bad isn't violating God's morality, then don't pass judgment on those who do partake. I do not drink. Right? It is unwise for me to do so. For me to do it, I would argue, would be me violating God's law. But for those who are able and capable of doing that, but I, I am called not to pass judgment. Verse 4 says, Who are you to pass judgment on the servant of another? It is before his own master that he stands or falls, and he will be upheld, for the Lord is able to make him stand. Let me read it again. Who are you to pass judgment on the servant of another? It is before his own master that he stands or falls, and he will be upheld, for the Lord is able to make him stand. Those who lack an understanding of Christian liberty will be tempted to point fingers against those who exercise it. And those who lack an understanding of Christian liberty will be tempted to question the salvation of everyone who partakes. And that's exactly what you see in Rome and in Corinth. They're eating meat that was sacrificed to idols. Do they really love Jesus? They're not circumcised. You see that in Acts. Do they really love Jesus? You see the same stuff today. Some things never change, right? Because our hearts are idol factories and we create things to divide over. We create things to worship. What we see is that Paul's goal is to set up guardrails against division, to avoid division. But ultimately, that the weaker brother would grow in his understanding. Not that the weaker brother would grow and necessarily partake but that he would grow in his understanding of Christian liberty. The goal was to have a true biblical mindset and understanding of Christian liberty. Out of uh, 1 Corinthians 10, 29 through 33, this is interesting. Because you can hear Paul's demeanor. Right? You can... You can let, let me just read it. it, it's, it it says, for why should my liberty be determined by someone else's conscience? Let me say that again. For why should my liberty be determined by someone else's conscience? If I partake with thankfulness, why am I denounced? Because, uh, because of that for which I give thanks. Verse 31. So whether you eat, whether you drink, Or whatever you do, that that covers pretty much everything else, right? Because that's what it says. You do all to the glory of God. Give no offense to Jews or to Greeks or to the church of God, just as I try to please everyone in everything I do, not seeking my own advantage, but that of many, that they may be saved. Right? Paul makes both points here, doesn't he? Why should my conscience be, be determined by somebody else's? There is permissibility to follow conviction. But there is also a calling not to seek to offend. Not to rub it in their face. Not to flaunt our liberties. 
but we're called to seek the good for those who belong to Christ. Romans 14, 10 through 12 says, Why do you pass judgment on your brother? Or you, why do you despise your brother? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. For it is written, I, I, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess to God. So then each of us will give an account to himself to God. Grace and mercy are always greater than judgment. When you judge others, you are trying to be God to them. And God is the judge of our actions, and we will be judged perfectly by him one day. Your help is not needed or required. Let me, let me end with this. We are missionaries here. You were created, and you exist for God's glory. So the kingdom of God and the gospel is bigger than your right to eat or drink whatever you want. Right? The the kingdom of God and the gospel is bigger than your right to eat or drink whatever you want. But also the kingdom of God and the gospel is bigger than your problems with what people eat and drink. Matthew 15, 11, Jesus says, It is not what goes into the mouth that defiles a person, but what comes out of the mouth. This defiles a person. If you are worried about people who are defiled, what destroys a person, it's not what they digest. It's what they confess and who they profess as God. Let us be more concerned about our lost communities than than our preferences or our opinions. And my prayer is that the same burning desire that we have for people to agree with us on these open-handed issues, that this passion can be transferred to caring about all those who from their mouth deny Christ. They deny his death and resurrection. I love this quote from Martin Luther. He says, those of a weak conscience and faith are led or to be spared that our Christian freedoms for doing harm, but for assisting the weak. For where, for where that is not done, the result is discord for the gospel, and the gospel is the all-important thing. In this room, no doubt, right, there are many different positions on these things. And it will take effort to be unified in our diversity. Division comes easy. All too easy. It will take effort to be unified. God has brought us together as a diverse people. So let us in our diversity and in our desire to be united behind the gospel, let us avoid division Avoid pride and avoid judgment for his glory. For he defeated death. Right? He defeated death. So not so that we can come together and bicker about these things. He brought us into the fold. Not so that we can divide. And he brought us from life to death. Or death to life. So that we can praise him. So that we can edify one another loving and caring about the burdens of each other. To show humility to one another. To take a diverse people, bringing them together, reconciling people who would never be in fellowship with one another. But that shows and shadows a greater reconciliation that we've all had to our God.